This is the very, very last lecture on recent environmental history um, that the AP test might ask about. Um, so how does everything get started? It's that very first, in the 1960s, how did the environmental movement, I guess, get started? If we look at the 1960s, remember all those other social, social movements, um, one of those was the very beginning of the environmental movement, and that kicks off with when Rachel Carson publishes Silent Spring, and you've probably heard about this in AP Environmental. But Silent Spring is about the impact of pesticides and chemicals on um, the, animal, the animal kingdom, so particularly birds. In this case, they're, um, one of the stories is about how birds are, um, spring is silent because there are no birds singing, because they've died off because of the use of pesticides and chemicals and toxins in the water and in the soil, etc. So the impact of this book is kind of like um, How the Other Half Lives, um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, Century of Dishonor, these sorts of books that expose how bad things are. So the impact is people kind of wake up and they're like, holy crap, um, we're doing really bad things to the environment and it's obviously affecting things around us by using all these chemicals and not having any regulation on our, um, our waste. So again, this opens people's eyes and gets people um, thinking about and starting to act um, on this. And so in the 1970s, partially because of this increased interest, we get the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. So again, the EPA is created in the 1970s to start kind of regulating and monitoring some of this. And so um, as part of that, we get um, the Clean Air and Water Act. So air pollution and water pollution both start to decline because we get the Clean Air and Water Act in the 1970s. Um, we also start seeing the regulation of toxic waste because of the incident at Love Canal. If you guys know Raphael Cudahy, um, he used to live in this area um, and was not there when this, when this all happened. But this is a picture of it. It's just a, a huge canal in New York um, where they were just chem factories were just dumping toxic waste directly into the water. This was then getting in, obviously, into the water supply and people were getting really, really sick. Um, and so the Love Canal exposes that people are just dumping toxic stuff into our water, and the impact is that we start getting some regulation of factories, so they're not just pouring toxic waste right into our water supply. Um, at the same time in the 1970s, we also have the incident at Three Mile Isle, which you may have seen if you've watched the movie Wolverine. Uh, while the X-Men were not involved in this, uh, there was really a nuclear disaster here where there was... Um, radiation and nuclear, uh, there was essentially a, a leak at this large nuclear facility that you can see pictured here. Um, and so again, people are really afraid, people were getting sick because of this, the, the, the leak of all this nuclear um, waste at Three Mile Island. The impact is we start seeing better regulation of our nuclear facilities so that they're not, again, just putting nuclear waste um, near people where they can, where they can get sick. Um, if you remember, we've also we've already talked about the oil embargo during Nixon's presidency, and this is where um, the oil-producing countries, they're known as OPEC, um, the oil-producing countries of the Middle East, um, embargoed us. They cut off our oil supply because they were angry at us for supporting Israel. So remember, Israel's a Jewish nation, the rest of the Middle East is Muslim. They're not happy with us for being in this alliance, and thus they cut off our oil. Um, this creates a massive um, economic crisis because we are very reliant on oil, obviously. Um, so it creates huge lines, um, huge lines at the oil pump, etc. And so if you remember, this is when Nixon creates a lot of his very progressive, very forward-thinking um, changes in energy policy. And this is where he introduces fuel efficiency standards, so like how many miles per gallon a car has to go. Um, he also started rationing oil so that if you if your license plate ended in certain numbers you could go on Tuesdays if you if it end, ended in something else you went on Wednesdays um, you also couldn't buy gas on the weekends so this was supposed to limit um, how much how much we uh, actually used gas and traveled so um, that was the impact of that is that we actually got for a little bit a really progressive, um, energy policy. 
Um, and then inspired by all these things, so nuclear changes, energy, gas policy, water and um, air pollution, um, we get Greenpeace, which is a very um, important, very uh, influential environmental group. They're very kind of radical. They do kind of crazy out there things. If you've seen like whale wars, for example, they're the ones that go and attack whaling ships. Um, so they're kind of out there. They do huge publicity events. They're the ones who will climb up in a tree and not come down, for example, or chain themselves to trees. Um, so that's what they do, uh, and they're created in the 1970s. And they, their impact is, is that they do raise a lot of awareness. They can be annoying sometimes um, and threatening people maybe sometimes, but again, they do actually get some good things done. So um, um, occasionally, again, get, get, some, get some important changes and awareness happening. So things get a little bit better, um, but we still see environmental cataclysms um, during the 1980s. The biggest um, was the oil, huge oil spill known as the Exxon Valdez, and this was the biggest thing until the Gulf Coast oil spill that we saw a couple years ago. Um, but again, what this does is it raises the awareness about how um, the risk of oil shipping and um, the risk, obviously, to the environment. So again, massive oil spill. Um, next one, one second. Um, with nuclear energy, again, Three Mile Isle exposed some things, but not enough changes happened fast enough, um, and maybe didn't necessarily happen around the world. And so Chernobyl um, happens in the 1980s, and you've probably heard about this. This is where we have a, a massive attack, or a massive leak, excuse me, um, in Ukraine of a nuclear facility, and you can see here the, the birth defects that happened from it. Um, the place is still cut off, it's still got a lot of radiation there, it's a huge wilderness preserve now. Um, but it also it just showed the need, for, absolute need for regulation of our nuclear facilities because obviously places around the world were not that safe and were leaking a lot of things. So. Again, just raising more, more awareness. Um, because of the exposure of things that happen at, like, um, like at Love Canal, Congress in the 1980s sets up something that's known as a super fund. And the super fund was a massive fund, a super fund of money, um, that would be given to companies to responsibly clean up their toxic waste. So obviously, companies have been pouring their toxic waste into water, dumping it in the ground, burying it, not storing it in proper ways or dealing with it in proper ways. And so what they said is, we're not going to try and punish you or criminalize you or anything like that. Just tell us where it is and here's money to clean it up properly so that we're not getting sick like the events at Love Canal. Um, and this is, the impact is that it's been really effective. Most of the toxic waste dumps have been cleaned up and dealt with properly, so the stuff is stored really well and it's been really good. The health has gotten much improved because of this. So again, the Superfund is really a really good success story um, in the environmental history of the United States. Um, 1980s is when you also start seeing people start talking about global warming. Um, scientists start saying like, oh, they might st they start seeing evidence that it might be happening and they start trying to raise awareness about it. It takes a long time, but again, 1980s is when people start discussing it. And so that carries into the 1990s and into today has really been the big environmental topic um, and it goes kind of ebbs and flows in, in popularity and concern. Like right now, we're at a, a lesser concern about it. It seems just kind of frightening. Um, but in the 1990s, we see in 1997, the Kyoto Accords are passed. And the Kyoto Accords were um, most of the world, you can see everyone that's in green signed on to these accords, saying that they agreed to limit their greenhouse gases to a certain amount so that to reduce the, the impact on global warming. Um, Again, that they limit them to a certain amount and that there would be different punishments if they didn't. Um, the red ones, so the United States and Australia, are the two that did not sign on to it um, because kind of like the Treaty of Versailles, League of Nations, they didn't want to limit their sovereignty. The United States didn't agree to being told to what to do and how to regulate itself and regulate its environmental impact. So again, a lot of people criticize the United States for not signing um, the United States very frequently doesn't like signing on to these sorts of things because it doesn't want to lose its ability to make its own decisions. So that's up for debate. It's kind of your opinion. 
Do you think that we should have signed it with the rest of the world? Do you think we made the right decision in not signing it so we could regulate um, ourselves? The other reason we didn't sign on to it is that um, depending on the development of the country, they limited their things to different amounts. So developed countries like the United States or France or England limited them more. Um, more developing countries like Egypt or Ethiopia, um, India, they didn't, have, they didn't have as strict of rules because they're still developing. And so the U.S. didn't think this was fair, especially with India and China developing so quickly, they felt that they should be the same as the U.S., whereas China and India said, no, we don't have to be the same because the United States got to go through a period of development too, so we get to too, so just kind of back and forth. So again, you make your own opinion about um, what you would have agreed with. Um, and so then, um, a few years later, a little over a decade later, they met again in Copenhagen, this was only a few years ago, um, and they just increased the requirements. So Copenhagen, they were there to discuss how much progress they had made since Kyoto um, and what needed to be changed. So once again, they signed on to um, different agreements, different limitations, increased, um, or excuse me, increased kind of their level of reductions in, in greenhouse gas production. So, and once again, the United States didn't sign on to these agreements either. So again, the arguments for ratification is that obviously to impact global warming, you have to have a global united effort by all countries, particularly the United States, which produces the most um, greenhouse gases, that we need to do this because clearly this is happening um, and needs to be dealt with and is seriously going to start impacting us. You can already see the impact on the weather, the severity of the weather. Um, and so again, this is only going to get worse. The arguments against is that, like I've said, um, the U.S. doesn't like to be told what to do. Um, they don't want to limit their sovereignty to decide what it wants. And they also think that it should be equal across the board rather than developed countries having more, having to give up more than developing. So again, it's up to you what you decide. Um, but that is it for the environmental history today.